really great to talk to you again. It's been a while. Um, and so I just want to say thanks for joining me on this extended interview. It's my pleasure. Do you think that you tweet too much? I think I tweet the perfect amount. I think if everyone tweeted as much as I tweeted, we'd live in a much better world. Yes, I think you're probably right. Have you quit, have you quit it or are you still actually checking it? I quit Twitter the day after the 2016 election. And I, I, I'm not, I don't think I've ever gone back, but um, if I have, it's only to post one thing, which I can't remember what that would have been. Got it. Um, I don't blame you. I'm, I've actually said repeatedly, I, I am surprised that any actor, director, or producer in Hollywood uh, stays on any social media. Well, I just feel like everybody's talking and nobody's listening. And, and, and you know, we, there's, there's just too many opinions um, in the world and not enough sort of good judgment about, you know, I mean, it's like I tell my kids, just because it came into your head doesn't mean you have to say it out loud um i don't know i mean it, it's i don't i don't have a strong twitter position other than that it's not right for me um and um you know i just think it's uh it's uh, it's just not for me sure if you if you could guest write and direct any tv series what would it be and why Oh, guest write and direct any TV series. Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, I mean, because there's two ways to go, right? There's, there's, you want to do something you're a fan of, or it's like, it'd be great to do Law and Order and do something completely different with Law and Order um, that um, uh, that the show is not doing. So. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a hard question to answer. Uh, I'll be honest. Um, you know, does Mad Men count? That, that would have been fun. Yeah, it does. If you could get the financing together for anything right now, what would you make and why? I wrote a Dr. Doom script I thought was pretty good. So maybe I'd make that. We've definitely all heard of the Dr. Doom script. Yeah. <laughs> um, jumping into uh, another thing. I heard, and I could be wrong about this, that you had pitched or had an idea for an Alien series. Um, is that true? That I pitched and had an idea for one? Uh, you know, a few years ago, FX asked me if, if, that, if that was a thing, would that be a thing for me? Um, and, you know, we had a conversation about it, but it, it didn't go very, go very far. And obviously it, doesn't seem to be a thing, alien for TV. But you know, it's. I mean, it's such a great. Um, it's such a great story. Those those certainly those original two movies. You know, um, are are so iconic. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's not. It's not in my brain right now. Sure. Uh, what's the status of Cat's Cradle? So Cat's Cradle, um, the status is um, I got busy is the status. Um, and then I wrote a pilot script that I really liked. Um, and then I worked with, um, uh, with the Daniels, who did Swiss Army Man. They directed for me on, um, on Legion. And then I thought, oh, th these guys are so great and inventive, like, since I'm um, busy, maybe I could bring them in um, to help me launch this. And so, you know, I've been collaborating with them, but they just finished directing a film. And so the problem is everybody's busy, but um, it is not a dead show. It just is a victim of our success. I know you've uh, talked about, or you've written, or you have an idea for a Star Trek film. Um, do you think with the amount of Star Trek TV series that are currently on the air, making a feature film is that much harder? Because there's, there's so much in the marketplace with Star Trek. One of the biggest challenges that, that anybody has right now is what is the feature film business? You know, cer certainly we're at a moment where the movie theater experience, you know, is dormant um, at least for a year or two. Um, and the only way really 
to make your money back on a hundred plus million dollar movie is box office. Um, and if you can't rely on that, like, how, how do you, how do you run that business? Um, you know, you, unless you have a, a really strong streaming play where, where, you know, which Disney tried with Mulan by charging $30 for it, you know, you can make back your money that way, but we, it's yet to be proven out that people will spend $30 for a home viewing experience. So, you know, I think, I think that's one of the biggest challenges of, of making a film out of a brand that people are already getting a taste of is, is just making sure that it's going to justify the expense of it. I think one of the problems with the Star Trek films, and let's just jumping in, is um, it, they're always trying to appeal to all four quadrants because you're spending all this money and you need to recoup that money. So I've often started thinking, or I've been wondering, is it possible to make like a 25 to $50 million Star Trek movie that is hard sci-fi, that's appealing to maybe one quadrant, the diehard fans, the people that love the genre, and a very smart, intelligent sci-fi movie, you know, without the big action set pieces. Um, and maybe that's the way that a Star Trek film needs to be made. Um, this is just me brainstorming, of course. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that. I think that's possible. I'll Although what, what you get into, especially with, with the, the film companies that, that don't have a strong streaming play, is that they're not in the business of making a little bit of money. The only business they can be in is the making a lot of money business, right? So it's the tentpole business. So if you were to offer them, you know, a $20 million Star Trek movie that could at best earn 80, 90, 100 million, it, it might not even be worth the price of admission for them, if that may, if that makes sense. Now, you, I'm sure you could go to, to CBS All Access or whatever and say, let me make a two-hour Star Trek movie for streaming. That might be worth it. But the theatrical experience, that's the challenge I think we're going to find in the next five to ten years is, you know, there was always going to be in, our, in this business a uh, um, you know, the, all these mergers and, and the consolidation. And we had this proliferation of content, right? We had 500 shows on the air. There was always going to be a, come a moment where, you know, once it stopped being so competitive for subscribers or viewers that the business was going to contract, you know, they'd spend less, they'd make less. And, and the pandemic basically forced that change on us right away. So I don't think we're ever going to see 500 shows on the air again. Um, because making things right now, the amount of extra expense and the risk and the danger of getting going and then shutting down the added expense of that, like you, you really have to want to make something. You really have to think that thing is valuable in order to commit to it, not knowing in the end how much it'll cost. Sure. Uh, jumping into uh, one of the main reasons I wanted to talk to you, which is about Legion. I absolutely, yes. I absolutely love Legion. Um, Thank loved. you. And uh, so I'm curious, when you pitched it to FX, did you, at the beginning, did you know it was going to be three years? Was that your goal? Or were you sort of like, I have this idea, let's see where it goes? Well, I kind of knew it was going to be three acts, if I can say that. Um, I, I knew that in telling a story about mental illness, let's say, that, that, that starts with, with David where he was, which is he'd, he'd attempted suicide, he was in the hospital, that there's a kind of journey, um, unfortunately, that's a cycle, right? You go from, from your lowest point to hospitalization, to taking your meds, to stabilizing, to thinking, I don't need these meds anymore, to going off your meds, to going down the rabbit hole and then back. You know what I mean? So, so that felt to me like if you substitute love story for meds, right, that, you know, David gets out of the hospital in that first hour. He's in love. That love buoys him. He ends up getting to a place from a place where he doesn't understand anything that's going on to a place where he understands everything that's going on. You know what I mean? And then unfortunately he's put in this position 
by the woman he loves that makes him betray the woman he loves, the same woman in two different time periods. And that gets him to a point where he's off his meds and his decisions are less and less rational. And then he's down at the bottom and he's either going to, he's either going to come all the way back or that's the end of him. And once you complete that story, the only way, place to go is back through that cycle. So that's why it was the three seasons. And I didn't know at the time if, three acts meant three years. It could have meant five years. You know, it could have been the acts more spread out, you know, but what I, what I learned in that second season of, of Legion, you know, when I was wrestling with a lot of episodes that were really long was that this show doesn't want to be long. You know, I would reach a point in an episode of Legion when I was editing it, where I would think this episode wants to be over right now. You know, like even if there was, more great stuff to come. It's a lot to absorb. You know, there's a lot of, of the sort of more surreal images, the fact that your brain has to work to kind of figure out what, where you are and what things mean. And you can only ask the audience to do that for so long before it starts being work and not fun, you know? And it felt the same with the overall story, which is, I suppose we could have kept going, but it felt like better to make a complete statement that you want more of than to make something where people go, I think that's enough of that. Sure. The, uh, I, I loved the ending of the series. Did you always know that was the ending from the beginning or did you find it along the way? Uh, I found it along the way. I guess I didn't know from the beginning that literally the first and the last images would be the same. Um, but, um, but it did have a kind of, you know, poetry to it. It felt like when I, when I figured it out and, and, you know, it's probably something I figured out in season two. Um, I think of where this journey was going to have to end. Uh, the, the ratings were never awesome on Legion, but it was a critical darling. Everyone who reviewed it, I mean, it's, you know, it, it got great reviews. Do you think it was those reviews and the buzz that sort of helped keep it on the air because it was, it, you know, it never got like 10 million people watching or, you know, whatever the, you know, some huge hit. Yeah. Well, I think so. I mean, obviously I have a larger relationship with FX and, and, you know, we certainly had conversations about it. I mean, the, the, the two things that happen when a thing isn't successful ratings wise is do you have to talk about, is it time to end this? And also, are you spending too much on it? Um, you know, neither of those conversations we, we really had. I think that they were not unhappy when I said the third year is the last year. Um, but I think they were hugely proud of the show. And, and, you know, critically, it's critical reception and, and just its perception, you know, there, there are a lot of superhero shows um, that, um, you know, as, as good as they are, often come down to good versus evil, might makes right, and we were doing something else. And I, I think they really appreciated kind of owning that something else. Um, now, if I were making that show now in a Disney universe, would the, would the budget, would they be forced to end it early, they might, you know, it's a different, they're under different management and, and it's a different, it's a different world. But luckily I got it in under the wire. Uh, one of the things that I loved about the way you told the story was the visuals and uh, just the, where the camera was and the in-camera effects and the narrative style, the, the choices you made. Um, can you sort of talk about the difficulty in, I think you had 21 days to make your pilot and the regular show was like an eight day shoot. How the hell did you pull that off <laughs> on the schedule you had? Well, you know, I would always tell the directors, let the simple things be simple. Right. Because I, some people came into Legion thinking that every shot, every angle, every moment had to have some gimmick to it. It was like, well, that's not really good storytelling. I mean, the reality is if you have good production design and great actors, like most of the time the camera doesn't need to do that much. 
you know what I mean? And, and there are scenes which are emotional or character driven or information driven in which, you know, the most important thing in the scene is that you get the information. So I don't want the camera doing this crazy thing. Your Michael Bay spin, you know, like that's, that's not going to help me convey anything. You know, the other thing is that I never wrote any visual gag that I hadn't thought through how to pull off, you know? So a lot of what I did on Legion was to sit with the directors and go, you're overcomplicating it. <laughs> like li literally I want something that you could do with a sleight of hand episode, you know, where David was going into everybody's minds and he went into Gene Smart's mind and it was this sort of like early video game with the text, you know, and, and, you know, like you, you, you are in a cave and they would type, like we walked down the cave and everything. And there was this moment where the, you know, where, where he typed jump and the moment he had entered the ceiling dropped and, and hit them. And, and it's like, that's just a very easy thing to, to do in a black void. You don't, you don't have to get stunt people involved, you know? So a lot of what I did was to say the, the, the you know, cinema is already a trick. Like it's, it's not, you don't have to go as crazy and, and go full ILM on this. It, it, you can simplify it. So, you know, but, but it really, you know, you have to have bold iconic images. And, and one of the mandates that I had in, in crafting each episode was that there had to be these moments that when you saw the trailer for next week, you were like, how did they do that? We have to watch that one. Yeah, for anyone who's watching this interview right now who has not watched Legion, get off your ass and watch. It's real good. Um, listen, I, I, got to, I have a million other questions, but I got to jump into Fargo due to my, my time. Um, yeah. Believe me, I had a lot of other questions on Legion. Um, uh, so I have to start with, with Fargo because um, it's so well done, but it was such a risky idea. Like, it's easy to say, let's do a Fargo TV series, but to actually pull it off and make it work is really effing hard. I'm sure people at the beginning were like, ooh, I don't think you should do a Fargo TV series. So have, since then, have you sent them like the reviews and the ratings? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not a vindictive person. I think su <laughs> success is the best revenge. Uh, no, I mean, I think that was to our advantage. I mean, my feeling in go going into the launch of season one that was that you know, was that two people were going to be watching and one of them would be hate watching, you know, that, that it was such a bad idea that it was actually very liberating to me um, to be able to make something with that were in which there would be no expectations, you know, all people could expect was that it would be a bad idea. And so, you know, I mean, I, I got away with a lot in that first year because I was um, simulating a Coen Brothers movie, you know, and I would say to FX, it's not that I want a 10 minute parable sequence, but it is a Coen Brothers movie. You know, I could justify, I could hide behind them, right? I could, I could take my most creative ideas and find some kind of parallel, you know, I could say in season two, you know, that the, the guys from MGM came to take me to lunch when we were brainstorming season two and they said what can you tell us about season two and i said well we're gonna make two fake ronald reagan movies and there's a ufo and there was a pause and then they said no really what can you tell us about season two and and you know what's great is that you can you know i could point i could say well look they did ufos and in, in the man who wasn't there and and you know so there is in the canon you know there there are these things that i can take and and uh etc so so it's um you know, it's the, the bad idea-ness of it was, was liberating. With Fargo season four, um, I saw the first nine episodes that were sent out. Obviously I'm all in and I cannot wait to watch 10 and 11 in six months or whenever I will be able to see them. Um, but I am curious, how much did you, how much does the network want to know the full arc and the specific twists and turns throughout the season? Um, now that it's in season four and how much does FX sort of at this point just trust you with the material and th knowing that you have the ability to tell these stories? There are great creative partners in that um, they never check out. You know, it's not that they don't trust me. It's just they love the process and, and they want to know how it ends as much as I want to know how it ends in that I don't know how to tell the story unless I know what the end of the story is because the ending is what gives it meaning. So 
when I sit down and say, here's the setup, I also have to be able to deliver the punchline so that they understand where everything's going. Even more so this year when there were 21 series regulars um, and that much story to juggle that, you know, they had to know that I wasn't dealing a hand of cards I couldn't play. You know what I mean? So, so you know, we had a lot of back and forths on it. And, and you know, one of the things that I find the most en entertaining um, is that every year the notes are the same. And even though the story is totally different, there's always a moment in which, you know, so someone at FX says, I don't know, it just doesn't feel like, the other years and, and you go, I know, but you thought that last time and it ended up, you ended up feeling all the right feelings. You're just not feeling them in the same place as you would have felt them last time. And, and, you know, it, I am always trying to challenge myself and the audience and, and FX on some level, you know, I mean, you, if you think that the Fargo conversations are weird, you should sit in on the Legion conversations, you know, and, and, and I did finally in Legion had a conversation where I asked, um, I mean, I asked John Langraff, you know, when you get the scripts for Atlanta, can you tell reading that script what the experience of watching that episode is going to be? And he admitted that he couldn't. And I said, yes, the script is, is the best blueprint that you can have. And it's a terrible blueprint for what cinema feels like. You know what I mean? Like there's no way that the script can tell you what the sound will be doing, what the cinema will be doing, what the score will be doing and the feeling that that will produce. Like I can tell you that you're going to have a feeling, but until you experience it, you can't know. A hundred percent. Um, when you, you, the series this season is going to be 11 episodes. Was it ever going to be 10 or 12 or how'd you, how'd you figure out 11? Well, I like 11. Um, but no, it was going to be 10. Um, it was going to be 10 up until let's say April, um, in which I was editing. We had filmed five, six, seven, um, and I guess we'd wrapped and we'd been wrapped, you know, cause of the pandemic for, for a month or so. And I'd finally watched the director's cuts of episodes five, six, and seven. And they were really long. Five and six were like 60 plus minutes and seven was 50 something minutes. And I just thought it's with this many characters and this much story, it's just too much. It's too much story to ask the audience. It's we're losing our focus and our momentum. And I thought, well, what we could do is, you know, we could break those three episodes up, you know, in, into a fourth episode, which will also allow us to kind of take some of the storylines that are kind of the, this is the also story in this episode, you know what I mean? And make that the featured story in another episode so that it feels like, oh, well, you know, episode seven, let's say, we're really living with Jason's character much more in this one, um, rather than, than putting those scenes, you know, as orphans in, in other episodes. Um, and ultimately, you know, I think it, it created a much more story drive in the middle of this of the season. Um, and you know, allowed, allowed us to really focus the, the story in a way that it d didn't just feel like, well, we wrote a long script, so here's a long episode. Yeah, there are so many specifics I have of this upcoming season, and I know fans will have, but I'm going to have to wait till later, um, especially we'll episode... A, we'll do a post-mortem. Yeah, I was going to say, especially episode nine, um, which, yeah. yeah, that's a whole different chapter. Uh, yeah. When you were casting, you have a fantastic cast in season four. When you're sitting down with a Chris Rock or a Jason Schwartzman or Jesse or whoever it may be, how much are they asking you the specifics of the full arc of your character, of their character, and how much do they know based on the previous seasons they're going to have a good arc? It's a little bit of both. I mean, you know, I remember in, in season two with Ted Danson, you know, having two or three phone calls with him because there's only one or two scripts, you know, at that stage you know, making sure that he understood that, that, um, you know, that, that role was going to be substantive enough for him. Um, you know, when I sat down with Chris originally, 
I didn't have a script at all. All I had was a premise um, and, and a bit of a sense of where it might go. You know, luckily for Chris, who was a Fargo enthusiast, that was enough. Um, you know, I remember having a couple of calls with Ben Wishjaw um, about the character and, and where it went. And, and, you know, I mean, I definitely speak to, speak to everyone. Um, you know, I had a lunch with Jason Schwartzman where I was trying to talk him into doing it. And I realized halfway through that he was trying to talk me into letting him do it. So I figured I was okay there. Um, and, um, yeah. And then Jesse Buckley, you know, luckily when I had those initial conversations with her, she was making this Charlie Kaufman movie with both David Thewlis and Jesse Plemons, and they both told her she had to do it. So I had help there. Yeah, that, that definitely helps. Um, what, uh, what you obviously, how did the ending of the se- of this upcoming season possibly get changed as a result of the long break you had uh, because I know you just started filming again. I'm just curious if like, cause obviously you had your scripts and you know, the, the pandemic shuts you down. Do you then sort of re-examine because you have this amazing advantage that you can cut everything before you're going to mm-hmm. shoot and you can really see the trajectory of everything. So I'm curious if those last scripts changed. The only way that they changed was, you know, I really had to go through them to make sure that, that everything that was written was a must have because we were asking the cast and the crew to come back together for two or three weeks to make sure that everything I was asking them to do, I had to have. Otherwise I was risking their lives for, for whim. It felt like. So the story itself, you know, with that many moving pieces, you know, I like to joke that you have to work really hard to make something seem random. You know, everything that, everything that was set up had to pay off and it had to pay off in the way that it was conceived. Um, all I was trying to do was to make sure that I had the most concise and, and, and artful version possible so that, you know, we weren't sacrificing any of the artistry um, of the end of the story, but we just weren't, you know, indulging ourselves. Got it. You directed, I believe, the first two episodes of this upcoming season. I would imagine you would have directed more, but you're working on like all the scripts and all that time and stuff. But did you end up, who directed the last two episodes? Uh, the last two episodes, so this, this um, director, Sylvan White, who, um, who did um, an earlier episode for us, and then Dana Gonzalez, who's the, the DP, um, who had done two hours earlier, you know, Keith Gordon was supposed to do the last two. And in fact, he had started directing before we shut down. Um, But in the end, he just didn't feel comfortable about his own health um, going back up there and finishing it. And, and as much as Keith is my closer and, and I I would love to have had him do it, it, it allowed me to split those two hours with two different directors and film them simultaneously which meant I didn't have to ask the cast to be up there for a month. I could only ask, ask them to be there for a couple of weeks, which was helpful. Yeah. I heard, and I I read um, that you guys were shooting with two A units um, to get it done as quick as possible. Yeah. We had a stage unit and a locations unit and, and the only crossover was actors Um, and then there was one moment in which the directors and the DPs switched but otherwise they were completely self-contained and separate units. You know, it was, um, you know, we, we literally had a 40 page memo and, and we tried to, to, um, and we tried to, to master it as best we could so that no one was really compromised. What kind of dogs do you have? The small, well, one's a basset hound and, and the one you're hearing is a cocker spaniel, but about the size of a, mouse i feel like <laughs> I know. it's like a uh, literally the runt so um so you as i said you, you directed the first two episodes um did you think about directing others or due to the way you have to write the scripts and everything it's just impossible i did i mean i, I my plan originally was to direct the first one and the ninth one the one you alluded to um 
but then it became clear given that our air date was meant to be April and we were going to wrap in March, that that was too, too tight. Um, then when we got the break and, and we talked about going back um, in August, I, I thought about directing either the last two or one of the last two. Um, but um, again, it was the, the air date was too, was too tight. And, and uh it just didn't make sense. It made it made more sense for me to delegate and, and let the seasoned professionals do their jobs. Before you started filming the first episode, how much, how many scripts do you typically have uh, on a season that are that are ready to go? And how much um, is everything sort of figured out um, in terms of the arc? And how much is it sort of being tweaked along the way? It depends on the season. Um, this season, everything was locked. Um, story-wise um you know because i had come straight from i had had this crazy sprint in which i did the second season of legion i filmed lucy i did the third season of legion and then i had to go into fargo i don't know did i have six scripts maybe i had six scripts no maybe i only had four scripts going into production um at first um and then, yeah, once I wrapped in December, I just started writing. And, and, you know, obviously I worked with writers and they had delivered drafts to me that I then had to go through and, and make sure, you know, do my, my pass on. You know, the first year I had eight out of 10. Second year I had six out of 10. You know, it's like I try, in a perfect world, I would have six to eight done before, just so I don't feel that stress. Sure. Do you have, okay, so with Fargo season four, do you have a like is there like a board and it basically shows you know here's like each episode you have almost like a log line how much do you have figured out of all the episodes prior to writing that first script if you don't mind sharing that sort of process no that's a good question i mean usually what what happens is i have i have the work that i do and this is obviously seasons two through four the sort of big picture work that i do um, here are the characters, etc. cetera. Um, you know, there have been seasons, and I think this was one of them, where, you know, we put a room together and, you know, I start to, to get the, the big picture kind of fleshed out more. And then at a certain point, I go off and write so that the characters have voices. Um, so that we're not talking in the abstract anymore about things. Um, and then, you know, I've learned to write the first two myself, just because, especially in this season, episode two, we, we you know, we introduced four more characters than we had in the first hour. So I wanted to make sure that I introduced all the, you know, all the characters. Um, although I guess, well, we see Tim Oliphant's character, but, um, yeah, and then, you know, once you have that general sense where you're starting to talk through and you're like, oh, this feels like episode five to me when this twist happens or this turn happens, you know, at a certain point, you've got enough of that. You've got, you know, 10 lines on the board and there's something in every box. And then you think, okay, well, now we'll just start to go episode to episode. But, you know, the most successful version of it for me is is to really drive the process, which I tried to do this year. I felt like I got in trouble in season three because because of Legion and, and doing Fargo simultaneously. And I just, you know, I had those same writers from, from the first two years, but I just wasn't as available. And so they, they would waste a lot of time. You know, they, they would spend a few days thinking about a story and pitch it to me. And I'd go, yeah, I don't think that works whereas if i'd been around i could have said on day one oh yeah don't bother with that you know so it just felt like inefficient and and there's nothing i hate more than inefficiency um and um i also don't want to waste their time i don't want them to spend all that time on something that's not doesn't isn't going to make it into the show so so this time around i you know whether i was in person or on zoom i would i would you know, I would sit there and, and go, well, here's what I want to accomplish today. You know, maybe we're breaking episode four. Maybe we finish breaking episode four and I can't be in the room tomorrow. 
But instead of starting episode five, I would say, you know, I'm not going to be here. So I want you to think about assimilation. Think about assimilation as it applies to all the characters and their stories. And then when I came back in, we would have that conversation. And from that would come story points that would, that would factor into different places. But I wasn't, I wasn't making them responsible for plot. Do you know what I mean? It was more about character and theme. And, and then I would come in and go, okay, well, this is what I want to do. And I was thinking we could do this, et cetera. So to really just take more control of the process early on so there's less waste. Uh, I'm just about out of time with you. So, um, of course, I have to switch to something else. Um, I, you have a very unique uh, ability. You, you create really great television. And I would imagine that there's a lot of people that would like to get in business with you. I know you have a deal with FX. Yeah. You, you have this sort of, you're in a very special place, a very rare place that, you know, you could probably come up with an idea to put it on television and you might get the money for the pilot. So what are you sort of thinking about in terms of how, how do you want to play those cards? Because there's, it's so rare in people's careers that they get that ability. Yeah. Well, I think we're at this at an interesting moment in which the feature business and the TV business are kind of s switching seats. Do you know what I mean? Like the TV business is in the front seat now. Um, you know, and when you see shows like Game of Thrones or Westworld, you know, um, when you see that scale is no longer an obstacle, you know what I mean? That, that you can tell an epic story um, on that scale, like that's interesting to me, I feel like right now is to sort of say, you know, also as a creative challenge, you know, can, can I look at, at world building on a much larger level and still have something that feels character and theme driven that, that isn't, that is entertaining, you know, on that scale, but is also, you know, nuanced and, and, um, you know, and, and will allow me to kind of push the medium to continue to sort of push the medium and see what it can do. So I guess in the abstract, that's what I'm thinking about is, is, you know, now is not the time to go small. Listen, I, I think that one of the things that I, I love watching television right now and I'm, I'm, I just watch a lot and I almost, I've watched more than movies right now because of what's being done and what can be done on television. And it's very hard to compare, and I, I, maybe you agree, what you can accomplish with characters in two hours versus what you can do in eight and 10 hours. You know, you can really get in there and, and, and dive in and, and you know, um, anyway, that's just something that I've noticed. Well, it's like, I thought that Dune trailer, I thought that was a movie in and of itself, that trailer. And I was like, how are they gonna fit all that into two hours and still have a coherent, moving story you know which you know i mean denis villeneuve i'm not worried that he couldn't pull it off but i also think you know how great would that be you know or you watch the mandalorian season two trailer and you think yes i can't wait to have 10 weeks to live with that story and and the places that it can go and the unexpected turns you can make because it no longer has to be what are the only the most critical things can make it you know, we can't make any detours or left turns like we got to get to the end of this. So I don't know. I mean, I still find the feature medium to be really exciting. And I loved making Lucy and, and I, I would certainly, um, you know, I'd certainly love to make another feature. But but um, I don't know. There's I'm just a long form storyteller. So so I find that really exciting. Dune is going to probably be two and a half hours, and Denis made Warner Brothers promise that he could make two movies. So it's a five-hour okay. story, and you're, we're going to see the first half. Right. All right. All right, good. Well, look, it's great to talk to you. Hey, listen, great talking with you, and just know I had a lot of other questions, but, you know, um, maybe <laughs> after, right. when the season is done, maybe we can talk about it. Call me up. <laughs>